Absolutely. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Lance Eaton. I'm super happy to be here virtually. I really wish I was in person, but somewhere in this week I ended up with a cold and <clears throat> I'm going to repeat this joke that while I want to spread a lot of knowledge and share some ideas, I do not want to spread a lot of germs with all, with all of you. So uh, thank you for having me. And yeah, I've been doing uh, a lot of today, the, the discussion and, and stuff today is just an extension of work I've been doing for like the last 15 years. Uh, I've been working in education and technology and a lot of thinking about how the digital age changes the game for how we pursue jobs and build our professional identity. Uh, I've been doing workshops on building uh, professional digital profiles using, uh, using social media and other practices for probably about a decade now. And well, you know, from ChatGPT's emergence, I've been thinking about how it can be helpful. Uh, it can be a helpful tool within all of this. So I hope what I've put together today is is helpful and useful. And there's a lot of things that uh, you can certainly follow up on. So what we're going to do today is I need to ground our talk in the acknowledgement about some of the concerns of generative AI. Then I'm going to be asking some questions about what is generative AI to get a sense of where we're at. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the discourse of higher ed in terms of students, faculty, and AI over the last 10 months. And then we'll get into ways to leverage and support students around AI use, consider some prompts, and then discuss some usage guide guidance. Uh, and of course, we'll have time for questions. So um, all of the slides here um, and that link that you see right there that says resources, um, these are all covered with a Creative Commons attribution and share alike license. Uh, this means that you can use any of them, uh, but if you do the things that you use, like if you wanna put it somewhere else or you wanna create a resource around it, um, it still maintains its Creative Commons license. The resource link you'll see uh, is what I call an annotated uh, slide deck, meaning it has all of the note, all of my text from the slides, as well as additional resources, some prompts to try out, uh, lots of different resources, and then at the end of that. Uh, that link is also a prompt guide uh, so lots of materials there for you to use for you to benefit for you to take advantage of. Alright, so. Uh, let's start off with. You know, this presentation was prepared using generative AI tools. I acknowledge that many generative AI tools may not respect the individual rights of, uh, of authors and artists and ignore concerns over copyright intellectual property in the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge many AI systems are trained in part through the exploitation of the of precarious workers in the global south. I also recognize that the structures to support the expanse of AI rests on continued large scale extraction of resources from environments in methods that have long effects on the local populations. And in the end, many of those resources, such as hardware, are often causing further harm in global climate change and environmental degradation, particularly and directly for uh, uh, for the global south in communities that are historically and presently marginalized. In this work, I specifically use chat generative AI as a collaborator, as a collaborative exercise, and to test out some ideas about its usage, better understand the tool, and may also demonstrate some of the ways it generates answers. So, to the degree that you can, let's do a show of hands of how many, you know, how many folks are familiar with these tools. So, how many folks are familiar with ChatGPT? Raise your hands if you can. I think I, I think I can see some movement there. Okay. Everyone. All right. All right. We got everybody for ChatGPT. What about Claude? How many folks are familiar with Claude? No one's familiar with Claude. Nobody knows Claude. That's okay. Uh, what about Claude seems like a great guy from Claude, our last presentation. Yeah, I like Claude. Me and Claude get along fine. Uh, what about Bing? Most of them. Most of them. Okay. What about Bard? A couple. A couple folks know Bard. What about Dolly? Oh, couple people there. And Mid Journey. Zero. All right. So totally fine. I, you know, these are probably the the most popular AI tools in the moment. And also, some of this may change as it has over the last ten months, and will continue to change for the next how many years? But. Just breaking them down fairly quickly, and again, in the resources, there's a there's a chart that kind of walks you through what each one is. But Claude and ChatGPT are text-based AI, artificial intelligence chatbots um, that you can actually talk back and forth with through text, uh, and that's primarily what they do. 
Bing and Bard are from Microsoft and Google, respectively. And these can be chatbots, right? Uh, something that you text back, like you write back and forth. Uh, but it, they are also integrated into Google and Microsoft's search engines. Uh, Dolly and Midjourney are AI image generators where you actually put in the in the description. Uh, you put the in description into Dolly or Midjourney and that tool generates an image based upon that description. The fact is there's thousands of these tools um, and I would encourage you to do some additional research to find the ones that are right for you or uh, for your work. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna largely stick to talking about ChatGPT because it is by far the most well-known and established. Uh, but again, within the resources, I have some other places and other tools that you can look at. All right, so we're gonna start with asking like, what is, what, what is generative AI? Um, so what I actually did was I decided, like many other folks do who's playing around with generative AI, I went and asked generative AI, hey, what are you? So I went to ChatGPT, I went to Claude, to Bing, and to Bard, and I said, what is generative AI? And they all gave a decent, you know, a pretty good answer with varying similar, both some distinctions and similarities across all four tools. And those descriptions were pretty large. They were like three or four paragraphs. And so I took all of those descriptions and I actually put them into Claude, as I mentioned, me and Claude get along, um, but I put them into Claude and told it to take these four definitions of generative AI and come up with the cleanest, clearest, and simplest explanation of generative AI that is under 50 words and can be understood by an eighth grader and maintains the full integrity of what generative AI is. And so this, this is the answer that it gave me. Generative AI is a type of AI that can create new content like text, image, and videos after learning from large amounts of data. That's a, that's a, a, a decent description and also one that can still feel a little bit effusive. Um, I think it's, it might be helpful for, for some folks and other folks, it still doesn't really reveal what it is. And so I then asked Claude after it generated that description, I said, hey, I want you to elaborate a bit further. And it came up with this description. Generative AI refers to the artificial intelligence systems that can generate new original content, such as text, image, audio, and video. These AIs are trained on large data sets, which allow them to learn patterns and relationships in the data. They can, use, they can then use what they have learned to produce new examples that are similar, but not exactly the same as the training data. So this is definitely more uh, a clear idea of what generative AI is. It gets into like the, the under, like the, the backside of it that confuses and is, is challenging for a lot of folks. Um, so I, I think it's a useful definition to work with. Um, I still don't know. The, the bar that I usually use is uh, my mom, who is incredibly smart in many different ways, is still a little less comfortable with technology. And so I'm always like, it's the mom test of if does my mom read, could my mom read this and it makes sense to her. Um, and I feel like it's right on the edge of that, maybe or maybe not. Okay, so that's just kind of like a, a background on, or at least an initial step into what generative AI is. Folks have been, are familiar with ChatGPT, so I don't wanna belabor that point too much. Um, but I do wanna spend some time giving a bit of context and thinking about the last 10 months. Um, I think, you know, it, it's useful for us to think about as we're looking at students, as we're thinking about our own practice. So first off, while generative AI existed before ChatGPT, right, it was already there. ChatGPT was the catalyst, um, right? These generative AI tools have quickly become ubiquitous after ChatGPT, but there were tools before last November. It's just ChatGPT was the one that like everybody caught on. And we've seen this with other technology that the technology already existed, but it was a particular tool that like got everybody excited. Uh, a good example of that is the iPod. There were MP3 players before the iPod, but it was the iPod that like got everybody's attention. So um, what I want to point out is that, you know, it is, there is, while there, AI tools are pretty ubiquitous, I think what's distinct about these tools and really overall the AI, help, the AI hype that we've felt in the last 10 months is that um, this does feel different from those hype cycles. Um, it feels, generative AI feels different because of its ease of use. Um, we are several years into the launch of the metaverse from Facebook and like, can anybody actually tell me what that really is? And if they visited it, like, honestly, is, is, can anybody like, 
give me the two sentence on the metaverse that makes me feel like, oh, I get it and I get why I would want to use it. We'll give a pause there and see. But I'm going to guess, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to guess no. Um, the lift to figure out what the metaverse is, how to access it, how to create in it, and, it or with it, and why it would be better than other things, like that's a lot to figure out. But with the with much of generative AI stuff, like it comes in the form of a chat box, something that we have all been using and has been around for decades, into which most of us are familiar. Yeah, you know, we know. See a text box on a computer, enter text, and that's what these tools are doing so well out of the gate. Um, it took something that was terribly complex in nuance, that is generative AI, and made it usable in a text box, and that's this devilishly easy invitation to want to play with it and to actually get comfortable with it. Um, and so I think this is the thing that we want to understand is like it has bridged something that, ha you know, is incredibly complex and made it accessible to people that um, other similar like revolutionary technologies still haven't figured out. Um, and so that devilishly easy invitation, um, it's changed some of the game of how we create. And in doing so, it's changed the power. And of course, for faculty, that's hard, like really hard, hard in ways that are not always easy to recognize. On a deep level, for many, there's many of us who have been teaching and supporting students in particular ways for years. And over those years, we've developed a deep and rich practice in philosophy of teaching, where our courses and our support are interconnected webs, where everything comes together in alignment with the things we ask students to do, the assignments, the, the projects, etc. Um, that alignment deeply interconnects uh, with whatever those outputs are. Uh, in, and we've been working under the assumption that those, or we, we believe those are fully created by students. Um, and sometimes we find out that they're not. And in this case, we, we find that generative AI really throws that, that cleanly aligned connection of like what they're learning, what they're doing, how they're showing up, what their outputs are. Um, it throws it into question. And that means, you know, to pull on that thread, that thread of um, output means to unravel all the other connected threads of like how you engage with them and what you share with them or how you teach them. Like it, it makes a mess of it. Um, and now it ha like now we're having to rethink what does it mean to review work, support students in their pursuits of internships and careers in an age where some of these tools may be misused or may misrepresent the students. And that's like that's a challenge. Um, it's in truth, it's not entirely different than the situation before. Um, it's just that there's more folks are able to access this easy tool, which makes it in some ways actually more equitable. Um, but students are still faced and faculty are still faced with that challenge of having to be the person they present themselves uh, to the companies and employers in the relationships that as folks who are helping students, you build with other, you know, you build these networks that uh, that can help students or, or that students can access through you. And now it throws a lot of those things into concern or question or challenge. Because in, in the thing is, is like generative AI, it's here um, and it's here for the foreseeable future. And so we really have to help ourselves and our students think differently or just to really understand that generative AI is very much like Google search and that poor search skills or poor prompting skills are going to result in poor results. Um, that it really is important for us to not dismiss the tool, not to ban the tool, but to really think about and engage with students around the tool. Um, you actually, you know, we actually have to work with them and help them understand that this is where critical thinking skills are going to be extremely helpful and important uh, so that they can advance their work in some way. Because if someone is taking, you know, taking the out, the outputs of ChatGPT or the like without deep review, they're already setting themselves up for failure and limiting their prospects. And I'm not saying that they get what they deserve, but they are, they are not necessarily helping themselves. And so that really opens up that question for us of, you know, what do we, um, oh, did I miss this? No, sorry. Um, how do we support students with generative AI? And so I think the first thing that we all have to do, and you know, you're here and that's a good sign, is get familiar with the tool. Like we can't advise them in, in leveraging it if we're not using it or gaining some level of familiarity with it. It's going to be one of those key tools in the toolbox. And because 
uh, because the, the toolbox can literally help with almost every part of the job or internship search process. Like we really want to make sure we have a grounding in it. Um, and this is one of those situations where avoiding it isn't going to make you, is going to make you increasingly less helpful to your students, right? That to say like, nope, I'm like, I don't want it. I don't want to think about it. It's not going to help them because they're still going to have to think about it both in the job search and as they get onto uh, their different jobs. Um, and I don't mean to center a tool uh, so much over people's wisdom and insights, but if it's not, but if it's not already, then in the, the next year or two, many industries are going to be using these tools. So helping students get familiar with them is going to be really important. And other students and job applicants are going to be using these tools to apply more effectively to jobs. So not helping students with them puts them at a disadvantage. The second is that to really think about where we where are the parts where students get tripped up and how this could help them I'll t for instance you know i've seen it in uh, I've, I've seen it used as a review of a job description and resume to more effectively help the job seeker apply for the position it might mean polishing up the resume clarifying the cover letter or making stronger connections between one's past work and the role uh, they are applying for i've also seen Folks use it, uh, use some context, uh, pardon me. <clears throat> I've also seen folks use some con some context in the job description to generate what are the most likely questions they will face in an interview uh, and even answer some of those questions to get feedback. That is, they'll ask generative AI, what are the most likely questions? And then they'll try to answer them to the AI to get feedback on their answers. I think what I particularly appreciate about generative AI is that it can open up what I, you know, what I, what is the the hidden curriculum of the world, um, and to me that's you know that's its most powerful and probably most problematic aspect of this tool. Um, it's powerful because it can be used to help folks get past artificial, superficial, or discriminatory bar discriminatory barriers. Um, there's no better example I can think of. Uh, than the cover letter. Um, how many folks here have seen some of the brightest and skilled students stumble, toil, or flub up their cover letter? Anybody here have, have experience? Oh, I saw a bunch of hands pop up, right? We've seen that happen. Um, I'm going to probably say something that's maybe a little controversial to this group, um, but to me, the cover letter is the most trite piece of writing ever. Um, it's this like rhetorically loaded piece of writing that requires the applicant to supplicate themselves before the employer in the hopes of an interview. And it's highly loaded and suspect to cultural, gendered, and racist interpretations. And the thing is, in the vast majority of instances, the job that the person is applying for often has nothing to do with how well they write a cover letter. Um, and so in layman's terms, I think it's, I have, uh, it is such a, it is such a problem for me. And I say this as somebody who actually writes a pretty strong cover letter, if my history of like getting interviews for jobs I've applied for through my cover letters is any indication. Um, so for me, it's you know the fact that people can now use the job description, their resume, and their own experiences to craft a cover letter that saves themselves a tremendous amount of time, angst, frustration, confusion is great. Like why toil on that when one can prepare for the actual important pieces of the application process? or what may be the more demonstrative pieces of the application process. So, in, and again, I think about whether folks are multi-language learners, neurodiverse, dyslexic, or just struggle a lot with like that, like both bragging about themselves and humbling themselves to an employer. Like it just gives a level of support that can, I think, really help job seekers. The other part of that, the part that I'm like, eh, worried about that makes me feel uncomfortable is that it does have a cost, like our uses of this tool does have a cost on language diversity and expectations of language. Um, the more we use this tool as it currently stands, the more it pushes us towards a homogeneous form of <clears throat> English language and one that was trained through the large uh, language model. One was that was trained uh, based upon English derived predominantly from like white and male cultures. So there's a lot of examples and explanations of why this is problematic. But for me, it just it concerns me in that it pulls us to get used to and expect certain ways of talking and writing that dismisses others who don't. And that doesn't feel right either. Language has always been fluid and dynamic and evolutionary. And so to do anything that like solidifies it or holds it still always. Uh, raises my uh, spidey sense.
Okay. So the third, uh, show students how they can elicit more information and understanding about themselves. Uh, I think this is, you know, this is one of the greatest ways I've seen it used is just really engaging in dialogue with it to understand what are the things that you're not seeing that ChatGPT or any of these tools might be able to like better connect. Um, Time and again, we all have examples where we talk to a student who's just like, oh, I don't have any skills. And then you find out that they did this amazing project that requires like 15 different skills. And you're like, what are you talking about? Uh, next, show students how they can use it to do more research about companies and industries they're interested in, right? How they can build their target list, but also see what is out there that they may not realize. I like ChatGPT in this regard because it can open up things that may just be harder to get to with a search because it, it, it takes asking questions that when you're doing say a Google search or even research in a database, like you're gonna find pre-formatted answers that may or may not align. Whereas ChatGPT is trying to specifically respond and it can really just highlight things you might not have thought of. Uh, you can also nudge students to use uh, generative AI to create first drafts or refine drafts before coming to you. Uh, what kind of time and energy can be saved when they are there are a few iterations into their outputs before you have to look at this? Um, and I'm a big fan of peer review, and I think that's still an important piece of this and would always encourage peer review. But there's something else about like what would it mean that you know the students are coming to you after doing a draft or two in collaboration with generative AI. <clears throat> that you can also look at. You can look at what those drafts are and see what this finished version is. Sorry, just need a drink. <clears throat> so oftentimes, um, you know, lost my place. Sorry about that. Um, so there are ways to leverage prompts with generative AI to just better understand what skills you have and what value you offer. Uh, one way I've played around and seen others use it is to provide details of a project that I worked on and solicit what are the skills that I was using and explain how those are skills. And often it just reveals things that I had not considered or realized. And sometimes it's offering something that isn't true, but often it's capturing I had capturing things I just hadn't thought of or realized to frame in the in some way. Right. And I think this is like there's this interesting gray area. And sometimes it's like, nope, I definitely didn't do that. But at other times it's like, oh wait, yeah. I like I did have negotiate I needed negotiating skills when I was in that role because I was talking with this other department and we were trying to figure out something. Like that's a way I can talk about what it means to negotiate. Um, so this can improve my own thinking about the value I offer to current work when I'm doing an annual evaluation or advocating for improved conditions or requesting a promotion. Um, it can also help me think about how I communicate my value if I'm job searching. And then finally, it might be worth creating your own prompt guides that you provide with your students uh, to work through as you're going through the course or going through a semester or in preparation to um, applying for internships or jobs. Uh, Luckily, you can have a good jump start as the, the slide deck for this has a bunch of those prompts with already available for you to use for you to kind of take and borrow and put into what you think would be helpful throughout the semester for students to actually um, build upon or use generative AI in conjunction with where you want them to go. So here's an example of getting, you know, a way to get familiar with generative AI. You can go off and you can read and watch a lot of things. There are a bajillion videos and uh, texts and all sorts of stuff on ChatGPT or any generative AI. Um, you can, you know, scan the resources I've provided. Um, and you can also go to ChatGPT or generative AI for help in figuring out how you want to use it. And so in this prompt, I framed the prompt to provide to provide the person with further guidance in helping students as well as provide some prompt examples. So the question I asked is, you're an expert faculty member at Endicott College who works with students to help attain internships, develop professional skills and insights uh, during their time at Endicott and support and guide students to successful jobs after college. Provide at least 10 ways that generative AI can help you in supporting and guiding students progress in their area. For each way, please provide a detailed explanation uh, directions on how the faculty member can do it, and at least three highly effective prompts that I could use to learn more. And so 
we're just going to quickly go through a couple examples that it gave. So in this case, it said, yeah, like here's one idea, resume review and enhancement. AI can analyze students' resumes and provide suggestions for improvement. Uh, implement an AI powered tool that scans reviews uh, resumes and provides feedback. Here are some prompts that you could use. How can AI improve the phrasing in this resume? What keywords are missing in the resume for a marketing job? What sections of my resume can be made more concise? Right. Um, so it's offered up this resume and review, this brief explanation. Now the thing is, the initial input may not be great. You may be looking at this and be like, meh, but you can continue to ask it and to elaborate and add or backfill or remove things. Right. So you can say, okay, this is a good start, but really what I need you to do is X, or I need you to revision, you know, revise this X. And, you know, in some ways you get to play the five-year-old child who asks like a bajillion questions because unlike humans, generative AI isn't going to lose its patience. It has as much time as you want to give it. And so you can have it continue to generate different things. And this is what I also like about it is like, it gives me ideas. I may ask it for 20 ideas. I may only like three, but now I have three that I didn't have to like spend my own time working on and I can start iterating on. Um, so here's another example is mock interviews, right? You can have AI act as a simulator for a job interview, and then they can actually interview the person in the given role with the given description, and then also solicit feedback from, uh, solicit feedback about their answers. And this is, you know, this is again, one of the ways where like, I know some folks have used it for like, um, some people have been using it for like RPG campaigns, such as Dungeons and Dragons, but you know, it, you can make it, turn it into a simulator for job interviews. Uh, here again, it, you know, it is soft skills assessment and development. So you can have it, you can set it up so that it can better understand your soft assessments, your soft skills, assess, your soft skills. Uh, you know, again, that prompt, that first one, evaluate my crisis management skills through a simulation. Right? So there's these really interesting opportunities for self-realization um, or things that you can encourage students to do as a means to then come back to the class or come back to the meeting for debriefing. Um, it can help with the tricky bits, right? So here's that cover letter example. I know, I, I'm sure you know students who are amazing and also freeze like a deer in headlights uh, when asked, you know, when asked to talk about themselves, reveal their actual abilities and experiences and stuff. And so a prompt like this can go a far way in helping them. And it's also useful in this case that it is a machine and not a human asking them, right? Um, that is, there's less hesitation or angst with trying to highlight or share. Uh, people are often going to, you know, I think about some of our students, some students and in talking to an adult, like there's all sorts of norms or where like you are not supposed to share in certain ways. You're not supposed to be uh, bragging for lack of a better word or like owning your stuff. So being able to just talk to, uh, talk to ChatGPT to help elicit that may actually get more information, uh, may have them be sharing more information that then allows for them to, um, for, for ChatGPT to better highlight and prepare them for a cover letter that they're, they're struggling with. Um, so for this example, like you can see that it can be leveraged just to help understand what are some of the things someone has done that one doesn't realize have transferable skills. And so in this case, in telling ChatGPT to act like a job expert, an expert job and skills analyzer and provide feedback that highlights no less than five skills, but as many as you can determine. Um, and then each skill should provide an explanation of how that skill is demonstrated and why that skill is important or valuable as a professional. Uh, and then I tell it the output should be a table and before calculating output, it should ask questions for clarifications and further insights to make sure uh, you create the most comprehensive list of skills as possible. So I'm telling it a couple things there. I'm telling it what I want it to do is to identify these skills based on a scenario. I'm telling it I want when it does that to give me additional information about each of those skills. I'm telling it what's the output I want it in. I want it as a table and I'm telling it to interview me. I'm saying ask questions for clarifications, get more details. And so I can give you specific information and then you can now adjust that accordingly. And so I give a scenario and it pops out responses like this. Um, so these are just a couple. There are more again in the resource, but in this case, you know, it is, oh, here's the skill that's been identified. Here's how it's demonstrated. And here's the importance and value as a professional. 
And I think that, you know, this, I know many of us in this room will do that continually. And also it's exhausting and there's things that we're going to miss. And I'm not saying ChatGPT will get everything, but it's probably going to get a lot of stuff and also have the time to really do that. And again, we want to take it with a grain of salt that it may have, you know, some answers are not going to be as good as others, but it can get people much further than where they, where they were without it. Uh, so there's also, you know, with this prompt, I set it up, setting up so that generative AI uh, to interview you and find out your specific interest and needs in developing that target list together. Um, so in conversation, in the conversation that follows, uh, you can uh, you can also add new things and realizations as they become clear. For instance, you may decide that you don't want certain companies, no matter what, uh, no matter what, or it will continue to help you to calculate. Um, that is really, again, this is dialogic. This is a conversation. So you're both asking it to help you generate a list. And you can also be like, oh, wait, that uh, I have no interest in working at that company. Like that company, like take that off the list. Let's find another one. And it can actually very quickly reproduce the information about a new company that you've already been training it to look at. Um, there we go. So this is an example of where you can leverage AI to improve drafts with a particular focus. And here I'm asking it to review my cover letter and give me feedback around certain types of writing. Um, I could go further and ask it to score my writing and even score its own, uh, its own writing in terms of how well it does certain things and give me a sense of the, pro of the, the progress in the writing. That is, I can ask it to like, not just edit, not just clean up, not just produce or rewrite a paragraph, but I can ask it to give me feedback and I can ask it to rate it. Say on, on a clarity scale of one to 10, like how good is this or what does this need? Um, or I can, I can say generate three different paragraphs, right? So I can say rewrite this paragraph in three different ways and rate each of them along whatever axes, clarity, specificity, uh, you know, uh, mellow style or light style or professional style um, and that's again a, a nice way to both like look at things understand what's going on with them and be able to make decisions um, all in that like to just try to write one paragraph is going to be a challenge and now you can have a couple that you can actually compare and contrast with and so that leads us to this question of like what makes a good prompt and the thing is these tools, you know, they're only as good as what you give it. And even then there's often some work involved. Um, and so we already talked about like, you know, it's very easy to abuse these tools, but what you get out of them is also often going to be um, less than stellar and be pretty obvious that, that the, not a lot of thought was put into them. Um, in many ways, it's still quite helpful in moving you along faster, um, especially if you struggle with writing or trying to self-promote as often as needed in the job search. Um, and so there is there is certain things that can help or enhance the, the way you elicit information from it. Um, sorry, need another drink. So, while artificial intelligence may be intelligent and have a lot of information it's not clairvoyant and so folks need to actually really give time to provide clarity and context to improve those inputs so what makes that good you know makes that good prompt um, context and details you have to provide it with a deeper sense of what you're trying to do you do this by front loading useful pieces of information and you know you can see the prompts in the the resources um, look at how those provide context look at how those tell what it is I'm trying to do, who I am, who I want the generative AI to be in that moment. And that leads to that next one is using the term act as. Now, as you go out and you explore and you learn more about generative AI, different people use different terminology. It's like act as, or you are, or whatever, but really emphasizing the context or the lens that you want the generative AI to look through is really valuable. It, it gets you better answers because you're saying like, I don't want you to look across all of your large language model. I want you to focus in on things that are related to these keywords. And so this fine tunes and focuses the AI model and draws upon a different, differently ranked data and gets better quality information. So act as a job recruiter or act as a hiring agent at company X and you sh that these should be in similar types of prompts should be helpful in getting better answers. 
Uh, whenever possible, I encourage to frame the use, uh, frame the response, um, especially when when um, when useful. You want to explain how you want generative AI to respond. Um, so in the, you know, in a cover letter, you might ask it uh, for professional but lighthearted tone, or you might, as I did, ask it to put something in, you know, put the output in the form of a table so that's easy to read. Really, you're trying to not just say, I want this, but this is this is the, you know, this is the box that I want it in. And the more you can do that, the better the results. And also like you'll learn this. Like you will put in it, you'll put in a prompt, you'll get an answer and you're like, eh, that's not exactly how I want it. And so you'll just respond. You'll have that dialogue with the chat and be like, actually, can you change it to be to look like this? One of its most powerful ways of being used is getting it to ask you questions. On a couple of the prompts I used, I said, ask me questions. Um, so what that allows for is the AI to get additional context for you before it generates its output. And that's a really great starting point that can really help fine tune what are the results that it's looking for, what are the, the things that you're looking for and how it can actually support you in that. Um, it's also important to realize that one of the powerful elements of this tool is the fact that it's a chatbot. And when I say that, it's think of it, it's very much like if you take out your phone and you go into your texts, you know, you are having a text with Maria and you and Maria can always go back and look at the history of that text and the history of that text informs the future of that text, right? So what's happened in the past in that conversation is going to influence what also gets said in that, in that text, uh, in that text thread. ChatGPT and other tools are very similar. They will create threads. And so you can go back into an old thread, a thread that maybe you started a couple weeks ago, and continue that conversation. And when you continue that conversation, it's pulling on the previous questions and the previous responses that it's given. Um, but if you go to a new thread, it's not going to connect that. So it's kind of like you're in a text thread with Maria, but then you go over and you start talking to Bob. Bob isn't going to draw upon any of the information that you and Maria exchanged, right? So just keeping in mind that it's helpful to have a context in that thread. And that's where ChatGPT and, and other generative AIs are really are useful. But if you move to a new thread, none of that old context is there. And so you might have to rebuild it or maybe you want a different context. Uh, a good example for me is like, I have a thread that I use around different questions about job, you know, job searching and whatnot. And that's one thread. I have another thread that's about gardening and neither the twain shall meet. Like I don't, I don't want it to try to draw upon my questions and like the back and forth of gardening when I'm asking it about jobs. And so I'll move between those threads depending on what it is that I'm asking of it. And then finally, collect useful examples. Um, you know, again, create your create a prompt guide, collect examples, share those examples, walk students through those examples. I can't stress enough of like helping them see the ways that you can best solicit ideas, information, knowledge from it, but do so in a way that is like helping them understand the prompt itself isn't necessarily the exact thing they want. They just want to understand how that prompt works to elicit the kind of information that, that you're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, when you think of prompt guides, you know, there's a couple different ways you can think of them. You can create guides for your students in a given course or where they uh, perform certain prompts in conjunction with what's going on in class. This can be really helpful and provide a lot of fodder for classroom conversations or one on one advising. You can provide guides for yourself to use for your teaching and working. Um, there's definitely a growing set of prompts I'm using uh, in this this work, such as creating rubrics and generating dates and providing feedback. Um, that there's a there's a bunch of things I've found it useful for in the teaching and learning role. Uh, and then you can actually like as a class create a class prompt book uh, that you build together and share useful and powerful prompts so that everybody can benefit from it. And that's something you could grow semester after semester with the different students that you're working with. Okay, and a couple of different things on usage guidance. Um, there are definitely some things to, to keep in mind in in usage of most of the generative AI tools out there, and it's important to have these in your head. Uh, the first is just to be careful about how you use these tools, particularly with student information such as their writing or anything directly evaluative about the student. The copyright and FERPA issues are still not entirely clear, and if the institution can't can't give clear guidance on when to, uh, or on when to and when not to use these tools, you should proceed with caution. 
Uh, my rule of my rule of thumb, which is non-legal and non-binding, and I am not a lawyer. Um, don't put students' work directly into a generative AI tool without explicit permission and explanation of what the potential downstream effects are. In terms of students and helping them, it's worth having a conversation about generative AI and what it can do and what it can't do and what's problematic about the tool. Um, yes, it can help. It can also wrongly provide information or ideas. Uh, it's only as good as the person using it. it, it, it it's only as good as the person using it at critically evaluating uh, its content. And yes, there's some bigger global uh, issues directly tied to the use of the tool, such as worker exploitation, environmental degradation, climate change uh, implications, and other things. Students need to at least know these things before they start using them to help them determine what is ethically best for them. So also the question of figuring out what is the appropriate level of help. Students are adults and they have so many pressing things and it can be really easy for them to lean on a tool such as such as this and do a lot of the work to get the job, you know, to get that job, like use AI through the whole process uncritically and just um, get through it. And there's some place, but you know, and there are some places where within the process, it makes sense to use, but obviously we don't want them to just wantonly and blindly accept um, and use the tool without thought and intention. And so our goal should be always helping them to think about in reviewing its outputs um, to see if it genuinely reflects them, their work and their voice. And this is where I think it's really powerful for you is as you build these relationships with students, as you get connected with them, like you, you know them on a level that the generative AI doesn't and can help them understand like this doesn't sound like you like in our work together like this is this is not who I see and so that worries me about as you submit these documents, what does that mean for. Um, you know, for when you actually go to the interview. Because while this this tool can be you know can help in the process it can't replace them um, and so when they're interviewing or in the actual work uh, any inconsistencies is going to have some some downstream effects so. Um, a couple of questions that's worth help guiding them to consider is, you know, how does this how does this AI output uh, reflect them? Where does it not properly reflect who they are? How do how do how accurate is the out, is the content of this output? And how can I verify or validate what it's saying? Uh, what if you know? Would you as a as a faculty member? Read it, read that AI output, and think, yeah, this is definitely the student. Or would you read it and be like? Uh, there's something I'm not seeing here. Now, it may very well be like it, it may be very, very well be that that's still an authentic reflection of the student. I think there's an interesting conversation to find that out. In other words, I always err on the caution of like, don't go to the student and be like, this isn't you and like dismissive, but approach it with curiosity, approach it with how, you know, what, what is it that they see that represents them in this particular output? Um, and then again, you know, what aspects within this process of securing a job do they need to be in fully control and comfortable with, right? And so it's that like, how much can they use it in knowing that they're going to have, you know, they'll probably also be using it on the job, but where, where are the lines? So finally, um, you know, it's just being thoughtful in how you guide students to use it. Um, I think it's a great tool and, and yes, I think students should use it. I'm also extremely hesitant to make students create an account um, with any company that doesn't have some kind of contractual agreement for services with the institution that I mean, I'm teaching at. Uh, for many of these companies, there's still this absence of clarity about rights and privacy, and we should be careful about how quickly we send students to use these platforms to share deep things about their work and their experiences without having and front loading that conversation and those concerns, right? It's one thing if the student is like, yep, I get it, no problem, fine, like I'm used to this, I grew up on social media, they know everything and, and I don't care. But there's lots of different reasons for lots of different people that using them may not be helpful. And so thinking about how you work with students with that. Um, an example I will give is that I've run classes where we're using generative AI and typically I will create uh, my own or I have my own account and I will give students access to it and say, hey, if you do not want personal information or you do not want things tied to you, such as like emails and phone numbers and what you're asking it, like use my account. and What's helpful is that creates a lot of noise for the tool because like I now have seven, eight, nine people using it and asking all sorts of different questions. So I, I could only imagine what gener like what ChatGPT thinks I am based upon all the different questions. All right. 
Um, so I am a professional. And so as a professional, I am, I am required to include at least one of my pets in all of my presentations because that's the kind of professional I am. And so this is Bear and Bear is wondering what kind of questions do you have? So good. Thank you, Lance, so much. I feel like you just, I popped into the resources while you were talking. Mm. And holy moly, there's a wealth of resources. So I'll make sure to share this with everyone um, and share, share this. And um, you're going to be sending me the recordings, correct? Yes. Although I yeah. think because it's your Zoom and I think I recorded it to the cloud, it may end up on your Zoom account. If it if it doesn't, I will make sure you get it, but you may just get an email notification that the you have the record the recordings have been uploaded. Got it. Got it. Um this has been amazing. Thank you so much for I know you're not feeling you I know you're feeling under the weather, so I really appreciate you still Absolutely. powering Absolutely. through and um giving us all this information. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Any other any specific questions? No? Good. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you. You got it. Take care. Take care. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.